Bibles, we'll be looking at Acts chapter 20 again this morning. And um, I don't know what happened with our normal handout. I know the file is on the computer somewhere because I just looked at it this morning. And, um, and that just brings me, I don't know how many of you are on um, Facebook or whatever like that, but I'm a little ways back. I created a page for our class and all the different elements of the handout show up on the page during the week. And if we get a good copy of the Baptist history and the Sunday school lesson, those show up on the page during the week too. So um, if you wanted to like the page, you could see those things during the week, perhaps, unless Facebook, you know, like buries it somewhere underneath the cat videos or whatever else that's coming up on, on your Facebook page. Uh, anyway. Um, but I will say, last, uh, we got the audio correct last week, and I don't know what happened with the video. The guy that was working with it said um, that while I was teaching, the sound was the brass ensemble. That was like 15 minutes before. I don't, somehow, you know, there was a digital spaghetti there or something. I don't know what happened. Anyway, we are looking at uh, Acts chapter 20, and Paul has... Uh, is now in the middle of his address to the elders, pastors, bishops, overseers, uh, what, uh, whatever you want to call them. There's about four Bible names for the leaders of the church there in Ephesus. And um, we actually see one of those in this portion of it. Uh, beginning verse 17, he begins this, well, it tells us that he called them down, and then in verse um, Verse 18, he begins to speaking to them and talking about his ministry, how it was service to the Lord, how he had taught them, had not held back anything that was profitable to them, how he preached um, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, and then how for himself, he didn't know exactly what was coming, but he knew that persecutions would come, but he was going to uh, continue going on. And then he begins um, in verse 28. We're going to look at 28 through 20, 31 this morning with, um, I think there's a better name, but my brain couldn't think of it. So I'm calling this uh, the, the Paul's Ephesian challenge and warning. He says to the, to the, this is to the elders, the leaders of the, of the church at Ephesus who are with him in Miletus. And he says then, in verse 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. So we have here his address, his warning, a challenge um, to the, the leaders, the elders, the pastors of the church at Ephesus. And um, you might be thinking, well, I'm not a pastor, so that's, you know, that's, that's, this is going to be interesting, but it won't apply to me. But I think it does apply to us each in, in, in parallel. In some way, every one of us leads something. <laughs> um, we might, if you're a man and you're married, you lead your home. You lead your wife. You lead your children. If you're um, in the ministry somewhere, you're, you're, you're ministering to other people. You're in one sense, even if you're a helper in a Sunday school or a junior, jun you wouldn't be a helper in a Sunday school class if you're in here. If you're a helper in a junior church class, you're at times you're leading that class, even if you're just if you're not the actual uh, the head teacher in there. So and and there's other principles here I think that we can learn from. So I so let's just go through here and see what it says, and uh, try to make be have a clear understanding of it. I think this is actually very clear. Um, but we'll, we'll just go on through it. So first he says, take heed, in verse uh, 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. I would say this, there is also um, the benefit of knowing 
what our leaders are supposed to be doing. Because sometimes, um, I don't think it happens, it doesn't happen very much in a healthy church, but sometimes the, the members of the church uh, bristle at the work that the leaders are doing, that the pastors are doing, and really they're just doing their best to obey the scriptures, and because they're a human and we're a human, we get, it doesn't always work out the way we think it ought to, and sometimes, of course, well, always, we think our thoughts are the best. Um, anyway, so the first thing he says is to take heed. He says, take heed. And I think we should notice that he says there's two things to take heed to. He says, take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock. So those that are in leadership, the first thing they need to do is make sure they take heed to themselves. Many, uh, many leaders over the years, um, we're, um, we're tempted or we're inclined to worry about everyone that we're leading, making sure they're doing this, making sure that they know this and, and all of that. And we don't take heed to ourselves. And Paul says to them, first off, take heed to yourself. Um, you are, uh, he, does, he doesn't say it there, but I'm thinking he's saying, you are a human being. <laughs> Later on he's saying, even of your own selves, there'll be people rise up that are gonna twist the scriptures, pervert the word of God. And so you, Take heed to yourself first. First, take heed to yourself. If, if I'm not right, if I'm not taking, uh, in, if I'm not taking care of myself, taking heed to myself. Now, as a man, I take very good care of myself. I got all the all the luxuries that I want to have, you know. But that's not the sense. Clearly, that's not the sense that this is talking about. It's saying you make sure that you are right that you are in the Word of God, that you know um, that you're following the Holy Spirit's guidance and all of that, and then take heed to the flock. In a certain sense, some men, some leaders, um, they get in a position of leadership and they enjoy the benefits of leadership and they don't care about the flock. They, it's like it becomes a job. It's, uh, it's got, you know, they go through certain motions and they, they, they do what they're supposed to do and they enjoy their position and they enjoy uh, the things that come along with their position and they take, they take heed to a certain element of the flock, maybe the ones that, that give in the offering, um, but there's other parts of the flock that they're not so uh, concerned about or that are more of a nuisance to them. He, Paul says, take heed unto yourself and to all the flock, every part of the flock. Um, so, he's, so there's two things there that the leader is to take heed to, themselves and to their flock and to all, and, and to all the flock. And then he says, uh, the next thing to, to notice there is that he's, Paul is speaking to them. He says, take heed to yourselves and to all, all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Um, I think it's interesting, and most people, many people are pointing this out if you think about it. Those men, probably, we don't see a lot of situations, but we see one or two situations in Scripture where they were chosen by Paul and the other um, people with Paul and the people in that church to be the elders in, in that church, to be the leaders of the church. They had, God had used human means to appoint, excuse me, to appoint them. But Paul here points out that the human means were just orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. Um, there's a, there's a, um, I don't know, there, there's a, there's a, I can't think of the adjective I want, but there needs to be a balance between this understanding of things. I actually, I'm um, speaking to the singles on Thursday um, college and every, all the singles in our church on Thursday about finding God's will or Wilma. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit's role in understanding God's will. Here, the, just, just to use for example, these, these elders, it was God's will for them to be the elders. And they could, they could point to, they could say, well, Paul called me or the people of the church called me, but, God, but Paul says, the scriptures say, the Holy Spirit is the one that called them. The Holy Spirit uses human means to accomplish his work. Um, 
they, uh, anybody could say, well, they didn't, they didn't take that position on their own. Let's just put it that way. Um, anyway, there's a balance that needs to be taken there, um, needs to be remembered when we speak of the Holy Spirit's work. The Bible tells us many, many ways that the Holy Spirit works. And if your idea of what the Holy Spirit's telling you to do is outside of the realm of how the Holy Spirit works, it's probably not the Holy Spirit. It might be what you had for supper last night. Or it might be just a strong desire that you have and you continue to think about. And you, won't, and you don't submit to the, the methods that the Holy Spirit has endorsed as how he reveals his will. Anyway, so, but these men had been called. They had, Paul and his helpers were, and, and the people of Ephesus were instrumental in bring, setting them up in positions of leadership as elders. And Paul says, the Holy, the Holy Spirit made you overseers. And then that's the other word that we need to, to recognize. And that is the word overseer. Um, an overseer, uh, if I'm remembering right, is the word episkopos. It's, a, it's where, um, anyway, it's somebody who over, oversees. It's not just, um, and by over, an, an overseer is, is not like, um, more like a foreman, maybe, in a certain sense. He is looking at things and he's directing the things. Um, not just, he's not just looking at, seeing what happens. He's, he's seeing that the right things happen, okay? And this is where a pastor who jumps into our lives and says, you know, I don't know that that's the right thing that you should be doing. He is doing what the scriptures say, a sign as one of the functions of his office. He's an overseer. He is to, he is to work and look to see that everything works out and, and that all the flock are doing, are fulfilling their role. He does have other things to do, actually. Um, the, the, the next thing is that they're to feed the church of God. But they're overseers also. They're to feed and to see over, to oversee. So the Holy Spirit has made these elders, these pastors, uh, overseers. And their work involves checking into the lives of the flock. I mean, a pastor that, that stays in his house all week long, doesn't do anything among the congregation, uh, comes out on Sunday morning, delivers a homily or a message, and then goes back away, he's, he, he may be feeding, or he may be putting food out there, but he's not overseeing. He's not doing all the things that describe uh, that, the, that the scriptures expect of him. Then uh, we should we note, and I already kind of did, that they are to feed the church of God. So take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock. And actually that next phrase is just kind of a descriptive phrase. They're to take heed to themselves and the flock to feed the church. That's one of the primary jobs of, of, the, of the elders. They're to take heed to themselves, to their flock, so that they can feed the flock. Um, I don't have time to, to continue down that path, but we, we've already talked twice in this uh, thing about w preaching the Word of God and teaching the Word of God, or three times even, maybe. Um, but it is the... It is the um, <laughs> It is the pastor's job to feed, pastor's jobs to feed the flock. Um, I will say, sometimes the flock doesn't like the food, but um, it, and, and I just say that because many many a church member who's got their nose twisted out of joint, they leave, and the reason they leave is well, I just wasn't being fed, um, and most everyone else in the congregation is is you know. In the scriptural, well, maybe in both physically and scripturally, fat. You know, they're just enjoying the blessings of God and the and the Word of God and all that. But this one person who sits in the midst of all these other people, uh, I just haven't. I'm not being fed, and so they move along to another church, and maybe just as well. Um, and I don't. I'm. You know, maybe it is just as well if they're going if they're going to have a sour attitude. Anyway. Um, we see here again, the, we see next, we see the tremendous um, 
value that God puts on the church and the love that he has for the church. He says here, and this is an important phrase in our understanding of ecclesi ecclesiology, that um, they are to take heed to themselves and to the flock to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Um, God purchased the church with his own blood. Jesus is God. There's a lot of different ways we could we could think through what, what that phrase means, that God purchased the blood with his son, purchased the church with the blood of his son. Um, Jesus is God, and he purchased the, you know, we're talking about the Trinity, so it's not, um, it's not something that our finite minds can, can fully comprehend. But we should, we, we should at least be able to take from that that the church, that, that the church is... Um, important to the Lord Jesus Christ and to God. Uh, a lot of people in the world today, um, if they go to church, many people who go to church just, they go to church like they go to a movie. You know, maybe with, with a little more um, obligation, but, but not much. They just go there because they know that's a good thing for them. Maybe they go to church like they go to a concert. You know, they get a little culture and a little religion and, and they're good. Um, God puts us a lot more emphasis on the church than that and um, cares a lot more about it. He gave his blood for the church. And so it's, not, it's much more important than, than um, the culture. Um, and so, and we should, I, I won't go into it, but we should take this to recognize that it's important to God and we should recognize what else God says and teaches about the church and make sure that we're in line with that. So he says, take heed to yourself. Then he says, because he gives them this challenge and then he gives them a warning. He says, I'm telling you to do this because some things might happen or actually some things will happen. He says, for I know this, that after my departing, grievous wolves or shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. So we get this idea that there will be people from outside the church that will come in and try to, to destroy the flock, try to destroy the fellowship that is within the flock, try to destroy individual lambs and sheep that are inside the flock, try to pull them out of the flock. What, how, you know, however we want to um, take the picture that he uses there of a flock, there are people, there are wolves, which of course are people that are going to try to come into the flock. We would probably think immediately in this context of what we call Judaizers. People like they, that had already by this time <clears throat> gone to the Galatian churches and tried to, to preach a different gospel to them. Um, people, there was already people in other churches that had done exactly this, th tried to do exactly what Paul is saying. And he's saying, I know, maybe they haven't been, they haven't showed up yet because they don't know whether I'm going to be in town. Sounds like he's prideful saying this, but I don't think so. He just is the, this, the, the way things work, but I'm departing. He's going to say in just a little bit, you're not going to see my face anymore. And I know that after my departure, they will come. And they will come and they want to enter among you, but they will not spare the flock. And then he says, also of your own selves shall men arise. And this is, um, this is, this is to me a little more um, fearful. Of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. So he says, beside the ones that you're going to get attacks from outside, there will also be people in your own, in your midst. It may be that what Paul says doesn't, um, doesn't, doesn't have to mean that one of the men standing there was... Um, a deserter was was somebody that was, but it does, but it doesn't um, exclude that either. Could be that he's speaking to four, five, six. I don't know how many elders. I get the idea that there's more than two there. Um, they're speaking to a 
quite a few, uh, uh, several men and one or two of them themselves down the road would begin to do something, would begin to, what does he say they would do? Speak perverse things. Now, we should not, today in our culture, we think, um, when we hear the word pervert, we say, that guy's a pervert. That's not what this word means. Um, speaking perverse things which is, is, is also the same idea as Peter talks about men who are unlearned. They rest the scriptures. They twist the scriptures. Um, if we said that guy's a pervert, we would also say, oh, he's twisted, right? Or we could say something like that. Well, this is in relation to the word of God. Men will take, they're to take heed to themselves, they're to feed the church, but they will take what they're supposed to be feeding there and they'll twist it. They'll put their own thoughts on it. And the result or the purpose, what's the purpose of putting their own thoughts on it? To draw men after themselves. When you, when we we appreciate, we should appreciate and love the leaders that we have, and we should follow them. Paul in another place. In fact, even here, he's saying these things. In the next verse, he's going to say, "Remember what I did." He, he's, and he's not saying that so you don't follow his example. We're to follow his example. But when men strive to have a following. Most likely, they are not helping the flock. They will speak twisted things to gain a following. And we, um, I think all human beings are, but in our own independent Baptist movement, our heritage, our recent heritage, we like to follow people. And as I look at many of the men who kind of built a following for themselves, they were able to do that because they would just take another, a novel approach, we might say, or, or a twist of the scriptures, and it brought more attention to them. And we, we, see, we see the results of this. They uh, pass off the scene, or they do something stupid, and a lot of people go off and do things stupid too, because those men had drawn people after themselves and not after Christ. And so if you're following a person, um, make sure that that person is following Christ, as Paul would say, rather than just uh, working the scriptures over, wrenching them around so that they serve their own, uh, um, their own purposes. And then Paul concludes by saying, therefore watch, and he's speaking to these elders, and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul tells us what his own practice was. He knew these things could happen, and so for himself, he always, it was always on his mind, always on his heart to be teaching and preaching. And what does he say here? Warning. Everyone, didn't matter where he was, didn't matter time of the day, night and day, with compassion, with tears, because of what may happen. He says in, in other, like he speaks, when he's writing to Timothy, he says, he names people, probably guys that were out of that church, because Timothy was in Ephesus. Maybe guys that were standing right there. I can't remember, Hermogenes and, and uh, I don't know, there's, there's about four or five guys there. Um, that might not even be the right name. I don't know. Those Greek names, I don't. Anyway, so, but Paul tells his practice, and I think uh, we've already taken a little bit of instruction from this, but I think that should be, he says that so that these men would follow his example. And we should follow that example. We should, I mean, are you leading people in what way? How is it on your mind night and day to warn them of the dangers that, are, that they're going, that they face? It should be, it should be, it should be for me. It should be that we um, are always thinking of how we can feed all of our flock, warn them, and we should, we should not do it because it's a job. It should be, um, should come out of a heart of compassion. And um, it just makes me think of what we, what uh, we learned from 
Philippians, the last time I spoke in church, that heart of compassion is the heart of Jesus Christ. The closer we get to him, the more we'll have his heart for the people that are around us. Okay, we're going to stop there. and.